MacGyver, SG-1, Chapter 2, 1 of 2, The Past. It was relatively quiet in the med bay under Cheyenne Mountain when Colonel Jack O'Neill woke up. Peering through sleep-filled eyes, he could see the monitors he had been hooked up to. Only the low hum and beeping from them filled the room. He had no idea how long he'd been out, but he knew it was one of the best rests he had had in a long time. He had come back through the ancient device known as the Stargate after days without sleep and no memory of most of that time. O'Neill was part of an elite team tasked with going through the portal created by an ancient race and search for life on other worlds. He had already been a successful military man, but had retired from active duty after his son accidentally shot himself with his father's gun. It was the call to lead the first, and possibly last, team through the unknown that got Jack out of his deep depression and back into action. His mission had been to go through and destroy the gate on the other side to stop any hostile threats from coming through to Earth. What he and his team found instead were innocent people being used as slaves by a hostile race known as the Gua'uld. They were a parasitic race who took over human hosts and had dominated races throughout the galaxy. Thousands of years ago they had controlled Earth and posed as its gods until the Egyptians rebelled and buried the gate in the sand. Over time, the Earth and its people had been forgotten, until our Air Force found a way to get the Stargate working again, and attracted all sorts of unwanted attention from hostile alien races. Now O'Neill, along with his team of archaeologist Daniel Jackson, Major Samantha Carter, and alien Teal'c, explored unknown galaxies in search of alien tech and allies to help them in their fight. Seems they found one, based on their last mission. While exploring a planet with the potential for understanding some writings of four other alien races, Jack accidentally had the knowledge of all four races downloaded into his head by looking through the device, and it was killing him. His curiosity always did get him into trouble, his mind subconsciously saved itself by overriding the thoughts and actions and creating a device that opened the gate to a new world. That of the Asgard, who was one of the four races that could help him. Jack only recalled the quick conversation he had had with one of them once the alien knowledge was removed from his brain. He was amazed at how much they looked like the classic little gray aliens Roswell, New Mexico always claimed they saw in the 50s. Short and almost robotic in the flat way of speaking, Jack got to thank them for their help, but also warn them that humankind was out there, searching for knowledge and getting themselves into trouble. Two revelations were shared with Jack. One was that humankind was well on its way to becoming the fifth of the Great Alien Alliance, and the second was more personal. As the colonel made his way to the open gate to head home, one of the little gray aliens informed him that he was, quote, one of two. Before Jack could wrap his head around those words, he was through the gate and back at Stargate Command. He was just relieved to be home. Now, it was all he thought about. One of two. Two what? People who made it to their planet? Two idiots who got their heads stuck in that alien device? Just then, Daniel Jackson peeked his head around the curtain that ran the length of the bed. Hey Jack, how you feeling? He was followed by Major Carter and Tilk, all eager to see their friend. Are you well rested, Colonel O'Neill? Tilk asked in his monotone voice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, doing better, thanks. How about you? I miss anything? Jack caught the excitement in Samantha Carter's face as he sat up and pulled the curtain back. Well, yeah, actually. Um, Sam and I did some digging, and the cryptic thing the Asgard told you, that you're one of two? Yeah. 
Well, we did some research and we found some shocking information. Jack's eyes squinted as they darted between his three teammates, waiting for Daniel to continue. And after a moment of hesitation between Carter and Jackson, the archaeologist continued. Well, Jack, it seems you were adopted. Jack blinked, stunned. What? The Major picked up the details. Well, sir, the doctor who delivered Will Foster was caught selling babies to unsuspecting couples in the early 1970s. Since you were born 20 years earlier, it's reasonable to think that the real mother never even knew she was carrying twins and therefore never knew you were stolen. Jack stared off to the side, trying to comprehend the knot forming in his stomach. How can he be adopted? He was forced to question the foundation of his whole life. His family wasn't his family. At least not in the traditional sense he always knew. Whoa. Was all he could say. There is some good news, though. You have a twin brother. Daniel waited for Jack to make eye contact and let the information sit in the air for a moment. By now, the colonel sat up at the edge of the bed. He was still wearing a standard green BDU pants and black t-shirt that mirrored his teammate's attire. He had been too tired to change into the hospital gown the medical staff preferred. Where is he? Does, does he know about me? We doubt it, sir. We went back and checked the hospital records. The day you were born, there was one other boy born that day. You won't believe who it is. Jack noticed the annoying glow of glee from the Major's face. Well, he's clearly handsome. Who is it, Carter? MacGyver, she announced to the three men who just blinked back at her in confusion. Jack was the first to respond. Yes, yeah, see, I have no idea who that is. Jackson answered, Well, apparently he was a secret agent for the government before ending up at a think tank called the Phoenix Foundation in California. A smirk grew on Jack's face. So, good-looking and heroic run in the family, huh? The comment flew past Sam as she continued where Daniel left off. It's more than that, sir. He's brilliant when it comes to improvising on the spot. He doesn't carry a gun and... Hold it, Jack interrupted. Doesn't carry a gun. What kind of a spy doesn't carry a gun? This one, apparently, she answered. You see, Colonel, MacGyver is a legend in the world of espionage. They say he can make anything out of everything. Except a gun, it seems, teased Jack. Folding his arm and wrinkling his brow, Daniel interjected. From what I read, he tries to avoid violence whenever possible. Oh, you two should get along great then, Jack responded with more snark than sincerity. He then turned his question back to Sam. If he's so famous, why didn't you notice that he looked like me? Well, he's kind of been an urban legend until now. Many of us use the name to describe creating something out of other things. He's kept a low profile and leads a quieter life most of the time. The Major took the opportunity to hand her commanding officer the tablet she had been holding next to her. Jack took it and looked down at the various pictures of his doppelganger from the 1990s, next to a list of stats the government kept on file. Angus? Someone named their kid Angus? What's with the hair? The three let him take it in for a moment. That's an older picture, Jack. He hasn't been in the field for a few years now, Daniel added while taking the tablet back from Jack. They knew Jack's humor ran sarcastic, but they sensed he was covering up the uneasiness he must be feeling. After a moment, O'Neill asked, So we gonna go check this guy out? I'm pretty sure I can convince General Hammond to let us go. Already done, sir, Carter proudly proclaimed. He was the one who got us the files and clearances we needed to piece all of this together. I think he's as excited as we are. Jack tilted his head to the side. The General's excited? I don't think I've ever seen him excited. You know, this could be some sort of alien trick or something. Daniel paused before responding. Not likely. MacGyver's been on the Earth as long as you. The only bad guy in this scenario is the doctor who stole you. 
Jack paused for a moment, letting the thought roll around in his head. Daniel was more than a teammate to him. Despite their differences, they were like brothers. His whole team was the closest thing the family he had ever known, until now. He could trust them with his life, and he knew they had his best interests at heart. Okay, well, I'll hop into the shower, eat, pack, and we'll leave in an hour. The three stepped back to give O'Neill the room to get out of the bed. I regret I cannot go with you, O'Neill. I have an appointment to meet my son on Chulak. When Tilk betrayed the ghoul to join the Stargate program, he gave up all he had known and loved, including a wife and his son Rayak, who was now in training to become a noble warrior against the false gods they had once served and worshipped. Tilk would make a point to check in on him off-world from time to time to review his progress as a soldier, but also to spend time with his boy. Wow, is it that time already? That must have been out a few days, huh? Jack looked down at his watch to check the date. Teal gave a polite smile and bowed his head towards O'Neill to show acknowledgement. Okay, well, good luck. Let us know if you run into any pesky Jaffa. With that, Teal bowed his head towards the group before leaving the room. Jack stood up and ran his hand through his hair to ruin any evidence of bedhead. As he and the remaining teammates left the med bay, he very dryly pondered out loud. I wonder what I'll wear. A few hours later, in the Abbott Kinney Boulevard loft of MacGyver, Sean Malloy MacGyver was waiting for the toaster to pop. Hey Dad, you want any of this? His father was relaxing on the couch, using the remote in his hand to flip through two different ice hockey games. Um, no, I'm okay at the moment. Thanks. Mac was thrilled to have his son over. Sean had his own place, but whenever he wasn't on assignment as a photojournalist, he was usually hanging out with his dad at his dad's place. It was a good-sized loft for one person. The kitchen spilled into the open living room that illuminated with the natural light coming through the large window that faced towards the street. Mac's main concern when he moved in years before was storage space. He had always been a pack rat and found the abundance of shelves in the garage off the street to be just what he needed. Who's winning? Sean, or Sam as he was known to most of his friends, took his toast and soda can from the counter and brought it over to the coffee table to join his dad in front of the TV. Uh, depends on the game. Canucks are over the Kings and the Penguins are tied with the Wolves. There were some differences between father and son, such as Mac's efforts to eat healthy and drink water or juice over soda. It was a trait he was hoping would rub off on his boy. One of the things they could bond over, though, was sports, ice hockey in particular. A lot of time, the two would go off looking for adventure either on their motorcycles or loading up the Jeep. Some days, though, it was nice to just sit and watch a game. Sam was wearing an old gray t-shirt that had the sleeves removed and a pair of black sweatpants. It was a warm enough spring day that Mac wore one of his short sleeve Henley shirts. A light blue one that coincidentally went well with his navy blue jeans he threw on in the morning. There was a knock at the door, and both looked back over the top of the couch to glance towards the noise. Through the blurred glass door, Mac could make out the outline of more than one figure waiting for him to answer. As he paused the TV, both men started to move to get up. Mac took the lead. I got it. As he opened the door, he was greeted by a pretty blonde-haired woman dressed in a black leather jacket, white button-down shirt, and black pants. MacGyver could tell by her stance and the short length of her hair that she must be military. On the step behind her stood an awkwardly-looking man with glasses and brown hair. He had a blue and white plaid shirt that hung over the top of his sand-colored khaki pants and was staring at him like he was a ghost. Hi, Mac asked more than greeted as he looked at the two wide-eyed strangers who seemed too stunned to speak. Um, hi, Angus MacGyver? Major Carter asked, causing a pained look on Mac's face. He always hated his first name and took great pains to conceal it through his life. He nodded, and she continued as she held up her ID. 
I'm Major Samantha Carter, and this is Dr. Daniel Jackson. We're with the United States Air Force. May we come in? Still puzzled by their arrival and curious as to what they could want, the troubleshooter stepped back and held the door open to make room for them to enter. As they did, they looked in the room and acknowledged Sam, who had stood up at that point. What's going on, Dad? Uh, good question. What can I do for you folks? Mac asked, trying to get to the reason for the visit. He hadn't been in the field for years, so that couldn't be it. Are you the MacGyver from the DXS and the Phoenix Foundation? Carter asked wide-eyed and almost giddy. MacGyver nodded and added, Retired? The Major fumbled for the words. Well, you see, sir, we came across some information in our research that affects you, and we wanted to make sure you were aware as soon as possible. Daniel, who often handled Della communication with alien life throughout many trips off-world, stepped in. Yeah, it turns out you have a relative you didn't know about. Mac shifted from confused to surprised. He looked back at Sam, who had been standing behind him. Yeah, that seems to be happening a lot lately. Okay. Who is it? Daniel and Carter looked at each other for some form of confirmation. After a second, they knew the time had come. The Major reached into her pocket and took a walkie-talkie up to her mouth. Okay, sir. You're clear to come up. There was a quiet pause while the four waited. Daniel tried to brace father and son for what was coming. Sorry for the confusion. We've never done this kind of thing before. Mac opened his mouth to ask what kind of thing when there was a knock at the front door. As he took his steps towards the door, he took one last glance back at his visitors to try and glean what was going on. As he opened the door, a wave of emotion coursed over his body. Shock, fear, anger, embarrassment cascaded over him in a warm wave all at once. That act of opening his front door changed his life and everything he thought he knew about it. Standing in front of him was a surreal mirror image of him. Same face, same build, same confused expression, but with a shorter hairstyle and different clothes. The stunned moment seemed to last forever, until his double spoke. So, this is weird, right? This is weird? Yeah. Yeah. MacGyver SG-1 is written, edited, and narrated by Matt Jackson. Music by Brian Bozowski. Art by Jared Brown of Darkstream Studios. Ermel Mall and Nathan Shell of Commission Credentials. Donations can be made through PayPal at macwjackson at comcast.net. Look for more on Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, and Twitter at macwjackson. Special thanks to Chuck Dixon, and especially Richard Dean Anderson, and everyone who is part of the Stargate and MacGyver worlds. Hi, everybody. If you're looking for the best in podcasts, audio series, and music, please check out the Forever Adventure Network. We have podcasts such as the Never Gets Old podcast. We have audio series such as the MacGyver SG-1 audio series and music by Harmony Constant, as well as blogs, comics, and more. Please check us out at the Forever Adventure Network. And as always, thanks for joining the adventure. The Forever Adventure Network. Welcome to the adventure.